Hello, I'm Dr. Rasmus Byrne from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. In this set of lectures, I'll be describing the basics of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. I've broken this into two parts, the first covering the basics of image formation, and the second covering the basics of image contrast. This is part one, image formation. MRI is an incredibly useful imaging technique, allowing us to see details of various parts of the body. It is particularly good at showing us the details about soft tissues within the body, such as the muscles and ligaments, the spinal cords and discs in the neck, and the brain. So how does an MRI create pictures like this? This is a picture of an MRI scanner. The MRI scanner consists primarily of a very large magnet. We put a person into this magnet and then send radio waves into the body. An MRI scan does not use any x-rays or other ionizing radiation. Here's a brief overview of MRI in one slide. When a person is placed into the magnet, the nuclei of certain atoms, particularly hydrogen atoms bound in the form of water, align themselves with the magnetic field. We then send a radio wave into the body. The body briefly absorbs this radio wave and then re-emits it. This radio wave tells us about the number of protons, that is the amount of water, in different parts of the body. And importantly, it tells us about the magnetic environment that that water is in. This magnetic environment is determined by the tissue structure. This, in a nutshell, is how MRI works. Now let us look at these steps in greater detail. There are three basic components to MRI, which can be understood by the three words, magnetic, resonance, and imaging. First, we place the person to be scanned into a large magnet. This magnet consists of coils of wire, as shown here in this schematic of an electromagnet. The magnets used for medical imaging typically have a strength of about one and a half to three Tesla. This is about 300 times as strong as a typical bar magnet. It consists of about 200 kilometers of wire and weighs up to 11 tons. The wires used in MRIs is superconducting, meaning it has no resistance as long as it is kept very cold. MRIs are therefore cooled with liquid helium at about minus 270 degrees Celsius. In addition, because the wires are superconducting, the current flows through these wires even without applying any external power. As a result, the MRI magnet is always on. Certain atoms, such as hydrogen, have a property called nuclear spin. In the absence of a magnetic field, these spins point in random directions as illustrated here. However, in the presence of a magnetic field, these spins either align or anti-align themselves with the magnetic field. One atom in particular whose hydrogen likes to align itself with the magnetic field is hydrogen, and especially hydrogen bound in the form of water. These spins process or spin around the magnetic field with a specific frequency, omega, that is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field, B, that they experience. Slightly more spins align themselves with the magnetic field instead of anti-aligning themselves. This results in a net magnetization. Now this magnetization is extremely small. Fortunately, water is one of the most abundant molecules in the human body. However, the magnetization is still too small to detect directly. The way we detect this small magnetization is by using radio waves and resonance. A radio wave is sent into the part of the body we want to image using a radio frequency or RF coil. These coils can have a variety of shapes and sizes. When a radio wave of a specific frequency is sent into the body, the magnetization is tipped away from being aligned with the main magnetic field. The frequency of the radio wave necessary to tip the magnetization is the same as the precession frequency of the spins. This is why we call it magnetic resonance imaging. The radio wave is then turned off, and the magnetization processes or rotates around the direction of the main magnetic field. This rotating magnetization can induce a current in a coil of wire or antenna. In other words, the processing magnetization generates a radio wave, which we can detect using a radio frequency coil. This receive coil can either be the same coil as used for sending in the wave or a different one. The amplitude of this radio wave tells us about the amount of magnetization 
and thus the amount of hydrogen protons or water in the body part we are imaging. The third step in MRI, the imaging, is to determine how much magnetization, that is how much water, there is in different areas of the body part we're imaging. In other words, we want to create an image of this magnetization. The trick to doing this is to apply magnetic field gradients. As you recall, the spins process and thus create a radio frequency wave with a frequency that is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field experienced by the spins. By making the field a bit stronger on one side of the image and then weaker on the other side, then by looking at the frequency of this radio wave, we can find out where the signal is coming from. The acquisition is then repeated with different gradients in different directions to build the full 2D or 3D image. It is largely this trick of using magnetic field gradients to create an image that got Paul Lauterbur and Peter Mansfield the Nobel Prize. Let's take a closer look at how the whole 3D image is formed. The MRI scanner contains three sets of coils that can produce magnetic field gradients in three orthogonal directions, X, Y, and Z. One way to get a 3D image is to acquire a set of two-dimensional slices. We can, obtain a we can obtain data from just one slice by applying a magnetic field gradient in that direction while we send in the RF pulse. As I mentioned earlier, the RF pulse will excite the spins if the frequency of the radio wave matches the precession frequency of the spins, the idea of resonance. So if we apply a magnetic field gradient during this RF pulse, only those spins whose precession frequency matches the band of frequencies in the RF pulse will be excited that is tipped into the transverse plane. We can control the thickness of the slice by either varying the gradient or the bandwidth of the RF pulse. Once we've excited that slice, we can encode a second direction by applying a magnetic field gradient in that direction while we acquire the data. Imagine we have an object that consists of two tubes of water. If these are in a constant magnetic field, both experience the same field and thus have the same frequency of precession. However, if we apply a magnetic field gradient, the two tubes of water will experience different magnetic fields and thus our spins will be processing at different frequencies. If we look at the frequencies within this combined signal, we can tell where the signals are coming from. And the way we look at what frequencies are in the signal is applying, by applying a Fourier transform. Therefore, if we apply a Fourier transform to our measured signal, we get an image in that direction. So how do we encode the third dimension? If we apply two gradients at the same time, one in the x direction and one in the y direction, it just results in a new gradient in the x, y direction. So that just allows us to see where the signal is coming from along that axis. However, if we repeat this process multiple times and each time varying the x and y gradients, we can use these set of signals, each of which is essentially a projection of the image perpendicular to that axis, to reconstruct the image, a technique that's called projection reconstruction. However, a more commonly used tech way is what is called phase encoding. Instead of applying a gradient during the excitation or during the acquisition, we can apply a gradient for a short time in between the two. This additional gradient shifts the phase of the signal being measured. We then have to repeat this procedure multiple times, each with a slightly different amplitude of the phase encoding gradient, and use a set of these signals to form a 2D image. If we stack the set of these acquired signals, each at a different phase encoding gradient amplitude, then if we look at the frequencies in each of those signals in the x direction, we can get an image in the x direction. And similarly, if we look at the frequencies in the y direction across different phase encoding steps, we can get our image in the y direction. Now this concept is often difficult to understand, at least it was for me when I was first learning about MRI. So let me break this down in a slightly different way. With frequency encoding, we apply a magnetic field gradient while we acquire the signal. If we look at the magnetization in different parts of the image, as represented here with these set of arrows, then initially after excitation, all of the spins are pointing in the same direction. But a short time later, the spins farther along in the x direction will be processing a bit faster and will have gotten ahead, while those in the opposite direction will have gone more slowly. So over time, the magnetization vectors are getting twisted up in the x direction. Now let's look at phase encoding. If we don't apply any phase encoding, then when we acquire the data, 
all the magnetization vectors are still pointing in the same direction. If we apply a small phase encoding gradient, then the magnetization vectors are twisted up along the y-axis. If we apply an even stronger phase encoding gradient, the magnetization vectors are even more twisted up. When we then acquire the data, the top row shows what happens without any phase encoding. The second row shows the data when we acquire with a small amount of phase encoding, and so on. Note that how the magnetization vectors are twisted up in the first column is very similar to what is going on in the first row, except that the twisting is in the y instead of the x direction. In this way, just as we can find out where the signal is coming from in the x direction by looking at the frequencies present in the signal acquired in these rows, we could find out where the signal is coming from by looking at the frequencies present in the columns. The only difference is that the frames that you see along the x-axis were acquired closer together in time, snapshots of time while we are acquiring the data, rather than across different phase encoding steps shown in the y. What I was showing you was actually just part of the picture. We're actually acquiring the phase twisting in both directions. Uh, the middle line is without any phase encoding, and the top is twisting in one way, the bottom will be twisting it another way. So this sequence of gradient pulses are actually also the reason why MRIs are so loud. If you've ever, ever taken apart a typical uh, loudspeaker, uh, what you might notice is that it has a large magnet at the bottom of it and uh, a coil of wire uh, close to that. And if you put current through that coil of wire, it creates a magnetic field that attracts itself to that magnet. If you change the direction of that current, it repels itself from that, from that magnet. And if you change the current back and forth very quickly, you can create vibrations. And in the same way, in that way you can create sound. Well, in this same way, we have current going through these gradient coils in the presence of a very strong magnetic field. And so even though we're not trying to uh, create sounds, the forces are just so large that uh, there is gonna be vibrations uh, within uh, the gradient coils that creates the sound. So this is the end of the image formation lecture. The next lecture will go more detail about the image contrast.